Well, welcome back to another episode of These Three Things. What a treat. Today we have Christina Drumheller all the way from Texas or Connecticut. Where the heck are you? Texas, West Texas A&M University in Amarillo, or it's actually in Canyon, Texas, but outside of Amarillo, Texas, that many may know from songs. Uh, and we were we were just chatting about how kind of cool it is in today's environment with LinkedIn and online and Zoom that somebody like Ben Morgan and Christina Drumheller can just randomly connect and say, hey, what you're doing is interesting. Hey, what you're doing is interesting. Let's talk. And that's what's bringing us here. So just a little bit about yourself, Christina. Um, pretty amazing resume. You're very close to um, a lot of the different scholars and researchers that we're connected with. So it's a pretty neat family. So just a little bit about your background for whoever's watching this. Sure. Uh, I am currently an Associate Dean of Communication, Art, Theater and Dance here at West Texas A&M. And I got my degree from the University of Missouri, Columbia. I did start at Texas A&M. So once an Aggie, always an Aggie. So <laughs> I have those connections and, and have really worked with amazing scholars in my career in crisis communication. And uh, that's where a lot of my research background is. And I am so fortunate to get to teach students about crisis communication here at WT. That's so fantastic. And, and you know, when we talk with people like Tim Coombs, uh, arguably a very prominent researcher academic in the crisis and risk communication space, we'll often talk about that, that there's a disconnect in many cases between academic research science and then the practical application of crisis communications in the field. Um, what I love and appreciate from what I've just heard from our chat earlier is that you are really focused on bringing through the way in which you teach, the way in which you approach your classes, that you're bringing that realism, that real world applicable pieces to your students so that they have some tools when they leave instead of just theories so that they can hit the boots on the ground. One of those pieces, ethics, professionalism, uh, and how it relates to the world of the practice of crisis communications. Uh, so let's talk for just a few moments about your top three things we need to think about as it relates to ethics in crisis communications. Absolutely. So the definitely the first thing, so sort of overarching, I think, is that ethics and integrity. I think that I try to impart to my students that it's so important that any time we respond to a crisis that we are thinking about the integrity of what we are saying and how we're communicating to any of our stakeholders, internal stakeholders, external stakeholders. And what we find time and again, when organizations try to, to blame somebody else or try to reduce offensiveness, that often it comes back to bite them, right? That they're not seen as trustworthy. You've got turnover in, in workplaces, morale becomes low because we can't trust those organizations to actually act with integrity. And, you know, and, and a big part of that for me, a lot of my research kind of uh, dovetails with leadership. So a big part of that is the leaders. What kinds of things are they wanting to do as leaders in the organization? Um, and some researchers like Seeger, Selna and Ulmer talk a lot about organizational learning and, and having ways that organizations build that into their culture, that everything that we're going to do is acknowledging that we want to act a particular way. So I think if we build that ethics, that integrity expectation into the organizational structure, when a crisis hits, we are more prepared to and, uh, respond more honestly with integrity and with care for all of the people who are involved and that we're caring for and so forth. And, and we always know like the top things we're doing, right? People for our safety, are they taken care of and those kinds of things. And I think that just needs to build, be built into the organization because we do know um, a crisis can be, it's gonna take us by surprise when it happens, especially a large crisis and we need to be ready for whatever um, happens, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I keep hearing over and over again, not here, but the expression spin doctor, <laughs> right? How can we spin this? 
Right. And I, I'll reply, we, we can't. We can, but we ought not to. We need to be approaching this from an ethical, uh, from a place of integrity, professionalism, because like you say, if we don't, it's more than likely going to bite us. We are so connected. Information is so connected today. Something is going to come up. I'll, I reflect uh, in 2013, city of Calgary and most of the southern uh, part of Alberta, that's in Canada, by the way, yeah. uh, experienced a devastating flood, the costliest natural disaster in Canadian history and largest peacetime evacuation at the time. And uh, there was a big aha moment for me. Uh, I was downstairs in the emergency operations center. I gave the mayor of Calgary, Nahid Nenshi, a briefing. As part of that briefing, it kind of went something like, your worship, uh, here's your key messages. This is what we really need. Uh, we'd appreciate if you focused on this, you know, kind of run through it. And then I said to him, and we're not ready to say anything, but you need to know, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so he went upstairs to the media room. He did a, he was always amazing at the, at the podium. He nailed all the messages and then he looked deadpan in the camera and said, and I'm not supposed to say anything yet, but you need to know. And we all were downstairs and we went, oh, no, what is happening? And he said afterwards, he's like, we're in crisis. And if we know it, Calgary's going to know it. If we know it, Calgary's going to know it. With the exception of, you know, any information that is protected or might interfere with investigations or legal proceedings or, you know, cause any risk, all of those exceptions. But it was a very profound statement that he said to me in 2013 which I think is a really great example of transparency. Right, which was which is really feeding off of that. And so while it, it took you all by surprise that he said it, the, it, it really was nice to see a leader. Um, to me, that second thing is transparency and it dovetails nicely with, with when we are um, showing integrity, that we're willing to say, here's what we know, here's what I think you need to know. And we're not trying to hide things because in the day of social media, I think this is what's really important that, um, people are going to start telling stories and they're going to start speculating. And if we aren't getting the word out, they're going to come up with something. And I think the more transparent we are, the less those tales get out of hand. Um, we had a situation in, in our area where one of the chain grocery stores had decided they were actually merging with another company and they were going to, we want to tell all of our people in person, which is a laudable thing, but their locations were all over Texas. And they thought they were just going to hop on a plane to the next thing and the word wasn't going to get out. Of course, by the time <laughs> it had gotten out and they had promised a newspaper an exclusive and it, that just all gets foiled. Right. So I, I think we have to be re really kind of be prepared for um, the way communication goes out now. No, you know, we've got Zoom, we've got all these ways that we can actually connect with everybody and say, here's what everybody needs to know. I'll, we're going to go still meet with you in person. That's a great goal. But first, let's make sure you know what the story is. You know all the pieces that we know. Because the worst thing that, that often happens in companies is that the employees are the last people to know or the key stakeholders. They, were, they, did, they heard it from somebody they shouldn't have heard it from. And you want to be the one who, who tells the story. You're the trustworthy leader. You're the one that they heard it from. And that is just going to garner that goodwill that we need when we enter a crisis, right? Those are really important pieces. Did you ever play the telephone game? Oh yeah. You know, where you start at one end of the table and you whisper, 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 whisper. And by the time you get to the end, it's a completely different sentence. That's what we're at risk for. If we're not trying to, like you say, communicate effectively, quickly, time. I use the term time appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what timely means. I see that in a lot of places. I, I just don't understand what timely means. So I've kind of gravitated now towards this time appropriate. When is it most appropriate for the message? I also re reflect a lot on my uh, paramedic days in paramedic training. When it came to our pharmacology units, it was always about the five R's of drug, like the right drug at the right time through the right route at the right patient, right dose. I think that was it. 
And I'll now use that to say, are we sending the right message at the right time to the right person through the right means coming from the right sender? Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So making that connection, um, which again, helps with that transparency and commitment. And I think that all kind of points to trust building. So maybe yeah. speak a little bit about trust and how integrity and transparency dovetails into trust. Uh, I Yeah, absolutely. I think that trust is, uh, it's so critical for our stakeholders to be able to, to trust what these organizations are telling us because they're the ones who kind of know the details and we expect that they, you know, COVID, we experienced a lot of this where we really wanted to trust the people who had all the information and, and media gets involved and social media gets involved and it becomes, it became a really big question of who do we trust and who do we not? And you don't want that to happen as an organization. Um, further, you don't want people to to be boycotting you. I mean, I, I think I, I look at the, the Bud Light situation that happened recently with um, the trans advocate and had they really stayed with here's who we are here's what we've always done but they backtracked and we didn't okay do we believe you now or and now nobody not any audience wants to buy your product and that's what's going to cause your your stuff to fail because you don't know who you are and the message you're sending we need to trust this is who you say you are you if you say you support particular organizations are you putting your funding that way? Are you being philanthropic that way? Are you that goodwill, right? We talk about that store of goodwill that um, companies can kind of fall back on and go, look, you know who we are. And so when we tell you this, you can trust us and you don't want to ruin that trust because that that really makes it difficult for a company to kind of come back and rebuild um, when they, they do that trust. And I think another piece of that is the better they're communicating effectively when they're willing to sincerely apologize for this happened, we know it happened, we're sorry it happened and we're sincerely sorry, not we're just trying to cover ourselves up or bolster or anything like that. We're sincerely apologizing and we're gonna fix it and we're gonna make mm -hmm. it right. And we're gonna make sure that Hopefully it never happens again, right? I don't know anybody can guarantee it'll never happen again, but we're really gonna put the things in place. Those are the, and those are the stories we remember, right? We remember that Tylenol cyanide case because it was so extraordinary that a company said, we screwed up and we're gonna, we're gonna figure out how to fix all of this. Now, none of us can open a bottle anymore, but that's a <laughs> different, uh, you know, it, it was, it's all about keeping us safe. And we remember those stories uh, about companies when, they did right by the public. See, now you're drifting into Coombe's situational crisis communication theory a little bit. Yes. I, I love it when it all kind of comes together. <laughs> you, yeah. You know, you, you, you bring a good point there. And I think for me, one of the most profound examples that we all saw was at the onset of COVID and the very strong messaging from authorities Seriously, people stop buying masks. Masks are not effective. They will not help you. That was the message we heard. Yeah. And then three months later, you're putting laws into place that say we demand that you wear. Uh, no wonder we started to have the questions around vaccinations and is this safe? What do we really believe? Because you pivoted three months in, more or less, about mask wearing and when you kind of take that approach it does degrade that trust and we know through the trust determination theory that if we want our messages to land with our audiences that 50 percent right like i intuitively decide when i'm listening to you i will intuitively decide whether or not i trust you and there's a lot of different factors that play into whether or not i'm making that uh, decision in my brain or not um so we need to keep that trust, especially if we want to demonstrate our integrity and approach our communications from a place of ethics. Um, and, you know, and we had so much, I, I think COVID is such a good example of how many, especially um, I'll use the United States as an example of the leadership that was in place at the time, giving such bad information and then companies having to go, you know, like Lysol going, please don't ingest us, do not do that. Um, 
You know, it does make it really difficult to uh, to say these health these healthcare measures are not just important for you, but they're also important for taking care of others. And I think that was one of the interesting things is that the messaging almost um, superseded how we care about one another. So that became almost a secondary consideration. We're not worried about others because um, we we aren't getting information that tells us what we're doing is actually working and going to work well. And when we don't understand that, and I think in the, uh, I'll just speak for the U.S. in particular, I don't think because of the way our healthcare system is that we have a system in place that says we are doing what we need to do, not just for ourselves, but for others to everybody stay safe. That's not the way our system kind of works anyway. And that was a foreign message. And the fact that it wasn't put out in ways that were really trustworthy for the larger population, I think that made it really difficult here, and especially in the U.S. <laughs> I'm just enjoying the conversation. I've lost track. I don't know. Have we done three? Because um, I have so a, it, I, ethics and integrity, transparency, leading into trust uh, and uh, apologizing and things like that. Those were sort of my three main things. OK, so <clears throat> I'm going to come to apology, but I want to come to this first just while we sure. have you. Um, what would you suggest? So. I love that you're so focused on your students and the learning. How would you guide them or give them advice if they're in a position where maybe you're working with a leadership group who you feel is not acting ethically and maybe maybe they're asked they're being asked to do something that goes against their own sense of integrity. So how do you how do you back up against a CEO or a leadership team that is really trying to push you someplace you don't want to go? Yeah, and it's really tricky. I do I talk to my students a lot about ideas of privilege. You know, our voice when we are in safe spaces and we're not afraid of losing our job, we probably feel a little more like we could push back on things. But if you're not sure how to pay your bills next month, you're often going to make a decision. You can't just quit a job. You can't just move on. And so, you know, I really try to build in with them that ability to make the decision that's good for them and recognize that sometimes they're going to have to do things they don't necessarily agree with. I mean, hopefully they know not to cross lines like illegal or anything like that. Definitely quit the job if you're asked to do that. Or or but, safety. You know, Rona, if, you're, yeah. if your safety's at risk, great. That's a, right? that's don't a do those one. things. You know, but if you're asked to just do something that I don't agree with the direction we're taking and you're going to have to do that just so you can put food on the table and live with yourself, then, you know, those are choices that we all, I think, make. We all have to decide if we can um, speak out against something that we disagree with and can we can we leave a, a position that we're not comfortable in anymore. And, and we all have to sort of make those choices. So that's really what I kind of, I kind of give them those tools because uh, it's one thing to say, well, you should definitely tell them I'm not gonna do that, but then risk losing your job and then you can't pay your bills. I, that's not something that I think is a, a fair request of anybody. But um, I also it, recognize that sometimes too, what we have to do in organizations, especially larger organizations is make spaces that we feel like we can at least go and feel pretty good about what we're doing over here, even if we don't feel great about what we did over over in another corner. Um, I'll use actually the example that is, is happening in Texas right now. We, um, because of state law, can re we really have to curb a lot of the diversity, equity, and inclusion types of things that we do on campus. And so, you know, there are official things we can't do that are part of that law, and we've had to stop doing, or we've had to like we've had to get rid of our our. Uh, chief diversity officer that are now in a different office and so forth. But there's still things I can do in my corner that make me go, okay, let me help my students feel like they're meeting the needs they're meeting. Let me help my faculty meet their needs, even if that's in my small corner of the word world. And I think that happens even with crisis where we're like, okay, they want me to do this, but I'm going to take care of my people over here. Sometimes we find there's other paths that we can do. And so I try to, I try to give them those critical skills that they can kind of go, what can I do and problem solve where I can. One last uh, on-ramp or off-ramp, apologies. I So there's apologia theory. There's You talked earlier about the you know scapegoating. Um, so there's bolstering. There's all these different types of responses that organizations can take to, a, to an event or an incident. 
that wasn't us wasn't our fault you right. should look at you know you think about the bp it was you know that company uh they're responsible the boeing max 787 it wasn't our yep. fault it was that part um talk to me a little bit about apology i know there's laws in place now that basically says in most cases just because an organization issues an apology it doesn't mean that they're taking or accepting liability or culpability they're just simply apologizing i don't know how does that land for you what do you think about an apology so i, I think apologies i think they're super important uh, across life period so I, I i feel like they're there's something we need to practice using culturally across different cultures sometimes apologies you know when you look at japan for example apologies are expected pretty immediately and in the right order by the right people and so they're already that's sort of built into their culture and it's probably a little bit of that collectivist culture whereas individualist cultures like the u.s where it's like me first i'm going to protect me and they get in that mindset that and i think we do have that mindset that that apology equals liability and that as you've noted it, it's that is sort of changed over time that it isn't necessarily true and i think there are ways that uh companies can say we are truly sorry for this happening and and i think the way that we want to hear the apology but i also think we want to hear how you're fixing it and so I think if they couple those, um, we've often find in our research, the research I've done, um, those apologies coupled with corrective action are some of the best tools in their box to use because said, we're sorry, and this is how we fixed it, um, versus trying to pass the buck, versus um, saying somebody else has done it. You know, I always joke, you know, Exxon being such a, a huge, the Valdez being such a huge crisis, and I always joke that BP was their greatest gift. <laughs> kind of forget Exxon and now here's BP um, because of some of the missteps that even BP had and, and their leader had, you know, being getting frustrated. and was like, I just want to go on vacation. Oh, that was a bad thing to say, right? Um, so I, yeah, I think that companies that can sincerely, sincerely say, I'm in this with you, we're going to fix this. I think that makes a huge difference in how those companies are seen. And I, so I, yeah, I think they're absolutely important that we figure out how to apologize and we feel comfortable with apologizing. And I think that comes with practice mm -hmm. and um, recognizing that, um, like you said, it's not always, that doesn't always mean liability. And a lot of times recognizing that sometimes you are at fault, everybody's going to find you at fault. And so the best thing you can do is say, I recognize that and we're going to fix it. One of the arguably a really great case study for apology was the maple leaf food listeria um, outbreak in Canada. I don't know if you've caught that one in your research, but uh, it's a really great story where the CEO basically excused legal counsel from the boardroom and just said, you can go. They protested and, yeah. and his response was, we're going to apologize. You're going to tell me not to so you're not required it would be behoove me if we're talking about apologies to not say hey dr drumhaller what do you think of this is are they owed an apology from somebody is, is it the commander of the police department here not if i if i thought it would help out apologize <laughs> there, but, 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 hey but hey but, hey but, there's so much to unpack there. Uh, have you seen that clip? I, I'm assuming you have because that... The Uvalde shooting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so much wrong with that. The, that the, que the question from the reporters in that clip, just if you haven't seen it, the question from the reporters in that clip is, don't you feel you owe the parents of the children an apology? There's all sorts of speculation around whether or not the public safety departments and teams did or did not follow protocol. That's not for me to debate or that's an operational thing. But don't you feel you owe the parents of the children an apology? And the response was, if I thought it would help, I'd apologize. Right. And but he doesn't actually apologize. You know, um, I think there's there's kind of two pieces here that I think that absolutely the apology would would help not because anybody like the apology is not going to bring their kids back or anything it it's that it's not the apology itself it's the um acknowledgement we didn't go in and save those kids 
right? Because really what the, what the accusation about the law enforcement there was that nobody was entering the school to stop the shooter, that who actually entered the school were parents. They found ways into the schools to try to rescue their kids. And that's what they were looking for was, um, we are so sorry, we did not have a protocol in place or the people in place to be prepared for this type of situation. And that is not gonna bring your kids back. And we've got to figure out a way to never let this happen in our communities again. And that's really what they needed to hear in that moment. And that wasn't what they were given. Think about uh, the message map and CCO, compassion, conviction, mm -hmm. and then optimism. Yeah. Dr. Drumheller, summarize again so I can put it up on the th your three things. Okay. My three things, ethics and integrity, transparency, and communicating with apologies and corrective action. There you have it. Uh, people can find you on LinkedIn. I know you're a big LinkedIn fan. I'm a fan of you now. Uh, love the way you te approach teaching. Our connection is small but mighty. Thanks for the conversation today. And Thank you for uh, having me. I loved it. Yeah, great. And uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. We'd love to. Oh, we should get you and Coombs on one and uh, have the West Texas, Texas A&M spiral off or whatever <laughs> we want to call it. And Truly, if you follow any of the news, we we often are watching crisis unfold in our own areas. And so uh, um, we definitely we probably can't talk a whole lot about them, but we definitely get to, you know, our, our students get to sort of experience how we um, respond to crisis within the system, because those, you know, all universities go through crisis here and there. So we definitely have our share around here. They sure do. <laughs> Don't run away. I have a story to tell you, but I can only tell you offline. Okay, sounds good.